Well, bless the Most High, Yah, Shabbat Shalom, and we greet each and every one of you in the mighty name of Yahshua. At this time, we want to begin by opening in prayer as we are assembling on this Shabbat. It's always a privilege and a honor to be able to gather because we gather not because of us trying to come together, but it's an honor because we're connecting with the Most High Yahuwah, and we are setting ourselves apart as He has set Himself apart on the Shabbat. Blessed be your great name. So at this time, let us pray. Abinu Makenu, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for bringing us to this time where we're able to honor you on this Shabbat. To give your most high name the praise and the glory that's due to it. We sanctify you. We set you apart in our hearts. And ask, Abba, that you would cleanse us from all sins, that you would renew us, and that you would receive the worship that we offer to you. Abba, we ask that you would be glorified at this time, and that everything that is accomplished, that it may be to your honor and to your glory. In the mighty name of Yahshua, we give thanks unto you, O King. Amen. Bless the Almighty. Let us declare the Shema. And we're going to declare it from the book of Devarim, commonly called Deuteronomy. The book of Devarim is the name that Moses gave the book, which literally means the words. It means the words. This book, Devarim, Moshe considered to be the book that contained the words of Elohim for his people and for mankind. And so we're going to declare the Shema from it, 6th chapter, the 4th verse. Shema Yisrael, Yahuwah, Eloheinu Yahuwah Echa. Hear, O Yisrael, Yahuwah, our Elohim, Yahuwah is one. And you shall love Yahuwah, your Elohim, with all of your heart, and with all of your soul, and with all of your might. Take to heart these instructions which I charge you this day. Impress them upon your children. Recite them when you stay at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them serve as a symbol on your forehead. Inscribe them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Bless the Most High Yah. Now we're going to read from Devarim chapter 5 verses 6 through 18. In other translations it would end at verse 21. Begin it at verse 6. I, Yahuwah, am your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, that's Egypt, the house of bondage. You shall have no other Elohim beside me. You shall not make for yourself a sculpted image, any likeness of what is in the heavens above or on the earth below, or in the waters below the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. 
For I, Yahuwah, your Elohim, am an impassioned Elohim, visiting the guilt of the parents upon the children, upon the third and upon the fourth generations of those who reject me, but showing kindness to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not swear falsely by the name of Yahuwah your Elohim, for Yahuwah will not clear one who swears falsely by his name. Observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy or set apart, as Yahuwah your Elohim has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of Yahuwah your Elohim, or the Sabbath of Yahuwah your Elohim. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your ox or your ass, or any of your cattle, or the stranger in your settlements so that your male and female slave may rest as you do. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Mitzrayim, and Yahuwah your Elohim freed you from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore Yahuwah your Elohim has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother, as Yahuwah your Elohim has commanded you, that you may long endure and that you may fare well in the land that Yahuwah your Elohim is assigning to you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not crave your neighbor's house or his field or his male or female slave or his ox or his ass or anything that is your neighbor's. Now we want to read in the writings of the apostles and we're going to begin the book of Mark, 12th chapter, verse 28 through verse 31. Mark chapter 12, verse 28 through 31. And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first, that is the primary or most important commandment of all? And Yahshua answered him, The first of all the commandments, or the primary commandment is, Hear, O Yisrael, Yahuwah, our Elohim, Yahuwah, is one. And you shall love Yahuwah, your Elohim, with all of your heart, and with all of your soul, and with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Bless the Most High, the Almighty be praised. We're grateful for the testimony of the scriptures that we have, that the Almighty has given to us, so that there might be a record, an ancient record, that will testify and speak to all of the generations of mankind that have come and that will come, that the Almighty has 
a set of commandments, teachings, that he expects for those whom he has created to live and to carry out. Each time when we gather on the Sabbath and we declare the Shema, we give testimony to the oneness of Elohim, and we also read the commandments. We read the commandments over in Devarim, and we also uh, read the passage that's found in the book of Mark, where our Messiah gives testimony and confirmation to the Shema, and also he gives confirmation to the primary foundational commands in the Torah, which are not part of the ten, but they hold a, a primary, I should say, position. Because in order to love Elohim with all of your heart and with all of your soul, and with all of your mind, you must keep those commandments that are related to him. And in order to love your neighbor as yourself, you also must keep those commandments that are related to your relationship or your interacting or relating to other human beings. And the reason why I say this is because Messiah said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so then we understand that love or the demonstration of love is based upon obedience to the commandments. And that motivation for an individual to keep the commandments is love for the Almighty, first and foremost, and love for our fellow man, those whom he's made in his image and likeness. That is why the Messiah said that the greatest commandments are these. So everything we do, uh, everything about us, it should be motivated by our love that we have for the Most High. And as we live our lives, for those of us who serve him and who have pledged ourselves to live for Messiah and the Almighty, it is based upon those foundational principles that guide our life each day in the keeping of the commandments. And so I want to encourage us to continue to Keep this word in our hearts and in our minds and allow it to guide us in our thinking and in the way that we do life in this world in which we live. The Most High be praised. Hallelujah. We do um, bless the Most High for uh, everything that he has done and uh, we want to ask that you all would continue to pray for us in our service to the King. We do ask that you would pray for us as we serve the Almighty and perform those things that he has asked of us to do so that we may be able to supply you that we serve with the truth of the word. want to uh, mention to you that uh, we have our Shabbat celebration as we are in progress now each Sabbath uh, Saturday to those who are familiar with the days of the week according to the world system uh, we call it the, the Sabbath we meet here at uh, 1230 in the afternoon and uh, we live stream at that time as well. And also during the week, we meet on Wednesday at 7.30 for our Bible study. And we definitely like to invite uh, those of you 
uh, who are with us to be a part of that. And those of you who are with us live stream, you can tune in because we are also live stream just as well. Uh, teaching the word of Elohim. Want to encourage you to uh, hear the teaching also via our YouTube channel, which is called Voice of Messiah Ministries, where you can go and uh, be encouraged in a variety of teachings. Uh, we have up over about a hundred uh, video teachings and sermons that are available. Uh, many of them are used in conjunction with our Bible Institute courses. For those who uh, may have a desire to uh, become more spiritually enriched, or if you are in the ministry or believe that you have been called to the ministry, and uh, you desire to be trained theologically, I would invite you to explore our Bible Institute, School of Messiah Bible Institute. You can go online and look at the information at www.ncmmi.20m.com. That is www.ncmmi.20m.com. And you can uh, look through the website and find the link that will take you to School of Messiah Bible Institute and obtain information to also be able to enroll or if you want to just uh, be able to take some of those courses uh, by free biblical studies we have free biblical studies just as well in that same uh, website and you can go to the written word library which is where we have our free biblical studies courses we make our courses that we have available in our Bible Institute, we make that available also for free biblical studies as well because we want this teaching to be uh, available for those of you wherever you are and wherever you might live throughout the world. We want to make it available so that you can obtain the teaching and continue giving the world this word of Elohim. To the nations and so we want to share that with you and hopefully that would uh, be something that would encourage you and build you up as well as help you to get to your place in the ministry as you're seeking to be trained blessed be the most high well this time we want to get into the teaching and uh, today we're in the book of Acts we've been in this book for some time and uh, we are in the fifth chapter, the fifth chapter of the book of Acts, the fifth chapter. Let's go to chapter five. I'm somewhat stuck as to which version I want to use today. I always teach out of the... Um, the Greek interlinear translation, but uh, I want to use the uh, New American Standard or the New Revised Standard, which is uh, also what I use. I find it to be uh, a good translation. I always go back and team. Acts chapter 5, verse 1 through verse 13. But a man named Ananias, with the consent of his wife, Sapphira, sold a piece of property. With his wife's knowledge, he kept back some of the proceeds and brought only a part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Ananias, Peter asks, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? 
and after it was sold, were not the proceeds at your disposal? How is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You did not lie to us, but to Elohim. Now when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard of it. The young men came and wrapped up his body, then carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter said to her, tell me whether you and your husband sold for such and such a price or sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, yes, that was the price. Then Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to put the spirit of Yahuwah to the test? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and died. When the young men came in, they found her dead, so they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear seized the whole assembly and all who heard these things. Now many signs and wonders were done among the people through the apostles. And they were together, or were all together, in Solomon's portico, or in Solomon's porch. Abba Yah, thank you for this opportunity to share this word in teaching. I ask that you would provide me with insight and understanding to be able to share to those that are listening under the sound of my voice, and that the scriptures would give light to us regarding the sacredness of who you are and also of your ways. May you be glorified, and we will give your name the highest praise. In the mighty name of Yahshua, amen. The Most High be praised. Now here in this fifth chapter, first 13 verses, we find a very frightening event occurring. Uh, for those who have been following us in the teaching, knowing that we just finished the fourth chapter, it described how that the apostles and the, the saints, the Messianic Israelite community, was at this time centrally located in Jerusalem. The apostles, in obedience to the command of Messiah, stayed in Jerusalem. They did not go back to Nazareth, but they were there. They were carrying out his command to declare the message of the kingdom of Elohim. And they were creating structure for the Messianic Israelite community at that time. The last part of the fourth chapter shows us how that the saints were selling their property and bringing it to the apostles as they recognized the apostles as now being the governors of this Messianic Israelite community. They saw themselves as being the true Israel 
of Elohim. And as they were establishing the structure, they recognized that it was important to set up the financial system within the framework of Messianic Israel so that the needs of all of the Messianic Israelite community would be met. We had discussed uh, last Sabbath how the apostles were Torah observant. They were aware of the system, the economic system, I would say, that the Almighty had uh, laid down the format of it in Torah and how that tithing and offerings were to be presented and how that the needs of the poor, the widow, and the alien or the, the resident uh, alien were to be met. And so in implementing these Torah-based principles, the people began to sell their possessions and bring it at the apostles' feet. And so we have a situation in the beginning of this fifth chapter of Acts where a man by the name of Ananias, he will be called Hanani in Hebrew, he and his wife get together and they decide to sell their property, which is not a bad thing. And mind you, when the people were selling their property, they were not coerced or forced by the apostles to sell their property. That needs to be understood. The apostles didn't go out and say, well, you know, if you want to really be blessed of the Almighty, just sell your property and all your possessions and give it to us. No, they didn't make that request. What we discover is that the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, was moving among the people and was speaking to them and had made known to them that a change had taken place in the governmental structure of Israel. That the leadership of the Pharisees and the Sadducees had been taken and given now to the apostles of the Messiah, Yahshua. And so with that recognition that they had, instead of them taking their funds, their votive offerings, because when they went out to sell their possessions, that was what you would call a voluntary offering, a votive offering. And normally when you would get a votive offering that you give to Yahuwah, you would take that to the temple. Or you could give a votive offering at the synagogue in the synagogue treasury. Either way, it was going to the leadership of the Israelite community. In this particular situation, the people no doubt came to an understanding that there was a shift in the leadership. And so they took their voluntary offering and put it at the feet of the apostles. Something that the Holy Spirit was doing and moving the people to do. As I said, the apostles did not make the people do anything and from what it appears, they did not provide any suggestions. And so as we go back and look into the text, let's just check it out. When Ananias and his wife get together, they decide to sell their property. But instead of giving all of the proceeds from the sale of their property, they kept some of it and gave a portion. Now, 
When we look at these first few verses, in particular, the first four verses, you don't see all of the details there. It just says that they kept back some and gave part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But when we listen to the words of Peter, Peter says to Ananias, and I want you to catch this. He says, why has Satan filled your heart that you should lie to the Holy Spirit? He said, he said to him, you know, when the property wasn't sold, it was yours. And you had the right to do with it as you chose. So we know based upon that statement of Peter that the apostles didn't write a letter because we don't have any indication that a letter was written and given to all of the saints saying sell your property and bring it before the feet of the apostles. They didn't do that. Peter didn't say, hey brother look, you know, you're supposed to give all of it. He didn't say that. I want you to catch what's going on here. He says in verse 4, while it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, listen to what he says, were not the proceeds at your disposal? Basically what it says, you have the right to not sell the property and not give anything. You were not forced to do it. And even after you sold it, you have the right to give whatever you wanted to give. So what we begin to see in what Peter is saying, and probably what happened was that when Ananias actually brought the amount of money to Peter, what he did was tell Peter that this is what we sold the property for. But in reality, he did not sell the property for the partial amount that he gave to Peter. See, Ananias wanted to make it seem like that he was giving all of the proceeds so that he could appear to be like the others who sold their property, all of it, and put it all at the apostles' feet. Peter had said, while it was in your possession, it was up to you. If you wanted to give a portion, that's great. Give a portion. You didn't have to give all. But the thing about it was Ananias and Sapphira had a spirit of pride and they had this desire to appear to be devoted. They had this attitude of wanting to appear to be sold out to the things of Elohim. And it wasn't that they had this attitude because they were trying to please the Almighty because the Almighty already saw the real deal. They were trying to look good before the people. Mm. Does that sound familiar with folks? Now, we get the deal of this because after Ananias falls dead, his wife comes in and Peter asks his wife, did you sell the property for such and such an amount? Catch this now. When he says that, did you sell the property for such and such an amount, he was asking Ananias' wife, did the property sell for the amount that was given to Peter? And his wife said yes, and she fell dead as well. So what we find is that the story goes, as I mentioned a little earlier, the story goes, Ananias came in, told Peter, look, we sold the property for this amount of money. And this is what it is right here. Lying to Peter. But Peter being full of the spirit. Full of the Ruach. 
he saw through that. And he said to Ananias, you're not lying to me. <laughs> he says, you are lying to the Ruach. You just lied to the Spirit. And when Peter challenged him on that, he dropped dead. His wife, when she came in, she also dropped dead. Now, the thing that I find that's disturbing to me in this scenario is that Ananias and Sapphira were doing a good thing by contributing to the needs of the Israelite community because it's a part of our obedience to the commandments of the Most High to not just give of the 10% of whatever increase we may have but also to give voluntary offerings. Did not the Almighty say over in Malachi he said that you are cursed with the curse because their produce was not producing. They had uh, trees whose fruit was falling prior to the time of being fully developed. The crops from the ground, they were being eaten up, you know, by locusts and other things. So they had a problem, and the Most High said that you're having this problem because you are cursed with the curse. The reason why you're cursed with the curse is because you have robbed me in the tithing and the offerings. So the commandments of the scriptures, it teaches us to give the 10% and the voluntary offering. So what Ananias and Sapphira were doing was a good thing that they were doing. But the problem is they had a heart that wanted to be recognized. They didn't have a right heart. They had a haughty spirit. They wanted to be seen among the other brethren as being sold out when in reality they were not completely sold out. Anytime you have a community of people, you have a group, you have an assembly, you have a brotherhood, a sisterhood, or whatever you want to call it. There's always folk in that group that want to appear to be something that they are not, so that they could be recognized. It's a spirit of pride. And Ananias and Sapphira did not recognize that what was going on here with the people selling their possessions and giving it to the apostles was something that was directed by Elohim. And they treated this work of Elohim by the Spirit as something that was of the flesh. They did not regard the sacredness of what the Holy Spirit was doing because their motives were not right. You see, any time it comes to the things of Elohim, it's so very important that we begin to recognize or must recognize the sacredness of what is going on as it relates to the things of Elohim. You see, in our day today, we have many that, what I would say, play church. They play religion. They play the faith. Because 
Deep down inside, they want the benefits of what the scriptures provide, but they do not want to be obedient with the requirements. And then you have those within the framework of it that want to be seen and noticed and given pats on the back for what they do or for what they give when in reality they do not have an humble heart or spirit of submission. You see, anytime it comes to the things of Elohim, one must recognize that everything that surrounds the things of the Most High is sacred. When you come into the sanctuary, so oftentimes people come into the sanctuary, and I'm not talking about unbelievers here, I'm talking about those who call themselves believers. And they will come into the sanctuary with a bad attitude or still having bitterness towards an individual, hatred in their hearts. Somebody did them wrong, and they decided that, you know what, I'm going to get them back. Claiming to know the Messiah now, but have determined in their hearts, I'm going to get them back. When in the scriptures, it teaches us that if a brother or sister has ought against you, that before you come and bring your offering. It says, first go and reconcile yourself. In other words, get things right with your brother or your sister and then bring your offering to the Most High. You see, there are folks who try to come and worship Elohim, but they don't do what the Almighty prescribes in order for their worship to be received. You see, Serving and worshiping the Most High, first of all, begins with reverencing the sacredness of the Almighty. So you've got to recognize that the things of Elohim are sacred things. You don't just do something and then think, well, you know, I'm going to get some benefit out of it. If that's your attitude, that you're doing something to get some benefit out of it, you have just minimized the sacredness of the things of Elohim. Ananias and Sapphira did not recognize the set-apart work of the Holy Spirit in touching the saints to bring the funds to the apostles' feet. They would lie to the Holy Spirit thinking that, they, now they didn't, they didn't know that they were lying to the Holy Spirit, mind you. <laughs> they lied to Peter. They lied to the governor of Elohim. They lied to the man of Elohim. And they did not recognize the anointing and the authority that was placed upon the apostles. They just treated it as though, well, he's just another man. You know, we'll look good before everybody else. You know, look at all that we've given him. You know, I don't know how much they got for their property. And say if you had a property and the property sold for about 200000 then you took a hundred thousand of that and kept because you figured we need to keep some savings for our retirement or have a nest egg just in case something comes up. We'll give a hundred thousand. You know, and a and hundred thousand is a nice piece of money to be giving. I'm not saying that they were not sacrificing. I mean, Ananias and Sapphira, you know, they sold their land. And it wasn't a bad thing. The problem was their hearts were corrupt. And that they did not treat what the Holy Spirit was doing as something that was sacred. They lied. That was the problem. Their hearts were corrupted. They could have just gave that portion 
and said, Peter, here, look, this is all that we can afford to give you. And Peter would have been fine with it. He said that, you know, you it's in your power to give whatever you choose to give. But the sacredness, the sacredness was not respected. See, people of the Most High, we have to understand that this thing that we do in serving our King, it's something that we must do selflessly and we must be meticulous in our obedience to following the Scriptures. See, there are many people who get in this thing and they want to be seen. They still have a spirit of the world upon them, of wanting to be recognized. Anytime you try to exalt yourself, the Almighty is going to bring you down. But if you humble yourself, if you recognize that you must remain in an humble disposition, the Almighty will see your humility and he will bless you. And he will exalt you. And the exaltation that comes from the Almighty, it doesn't come so that you can say, hey, look at me. I'm a bishop now. No. It's not so that you can say, hey, look at me. I'm this in the congregation now. It's not so that you can say, hey, look at me. I've made it to become superintendent now. Or whatever position that people have and that they go in in the assemblies of Elohim. Doesn't matter what it is. Doesn't matter what title it is. Exaltation comes not for the glorification of the individual, but so that the person could be used by Elohim. He gives them greater responsibility so that their, well, let me say this right, so that mm -hmm. their riches in the heavenly their reward in the heavenlies might be increased. See, many times folk are looking for riches and reward down here. They don't understand that this work is to be done in such a way where we hide ourselves, you see. We need to do this work in such a way where we have to make it known to men that it's not about us, but it's about the Almighty. This thing that we do and that we preach, we preach it not to bring glory to ourselves, but to bring glory to the Creator, the one who made us. Those of us who serve Him and that stand in positions of leadership on the behalf of the Most High. We have a heavy charge upon our lives because should we for any reason take the glory or take the credit, then we have a judgment that awaits us. And it's so very important that when it comes to the things of Elohim, we must regard it as sacred. I find in this generation that we are in today that we don't hold the things of Elohim in sacredness. The world has got the minds of many believers so twisted that they question everything that the servants of the Most High do. So that there is a distrust regarding the truthfulness of what the servants of Elohim bring forth. There's a question as far as is that servant of Elohim righteous or ethical? And you have many that claim to be ministers of the Most High that are not ethical and that are not righteous based upon how they live their lives and based upon what they demonstrate. But regardless of that particularity, we who serve the Most High must regard Him, the Almighty, and the things of the Almighty as sacred. And the people of the Most High must return back to regarding the things of the Almighty as being sacred. The people of the Most High come into the sanctuary and gather together for worship. 
we should immediately begin to take upon ourselves a mindset of repentance. When we come into the sanctuary, we should immediately begin to ask the Father to forgive us of our sins. We must immediately begin to ask the Father to cleanse us of our ways. When Messiah taught his disciples to pray, when they asked him, teach us to pray, he said, when you pray, you pray our Father. You pray Avinu Hashemayim, our Father, who is in the heavens. Set apart is your name, your kingdom come, your will be done here in the earth just as it is in the heavens. In other words, Abba Yah, as heaven is orderly, as the place where you sit and govern and rule the universe is orderly, May your order come in our realm and may we live in submission to your order in our realm. And he said, when you're praying, you ask, give us this day our daily bread. And then he said, forgive us of our debts, our sins, our trespasses as we forgive others who trespass against us. So when we come into the sanctuary and begin to involve ourselves in something that we consider to be set apart or holy, because our gathering on the Shabbats, it is called a holy convocation or a set apart time of gathering. When we do this, we should immediately prepare our minds and our hearts and ask forgiveness of sin so that our prayer, our worship can be received. Messiah, when he taught us to pray, he taught us all those things. He said, these are the things you need to do when you pray. Why? Because to Elohim is the kingdom. The kingdom belongs to Elohim. The glory belongs to Elohim. Forever and ever. That's why it says for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. The kingdom don't belong to me. The kingdom doesn't belong to you. The kingdom doesn't belong to any apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, whoever you might be, whatever title you might have, the kingdom doesn't belong to you. The heritage of the Almighty doesn't belong to you. Many of you going around talking about my church, my this, my ministry, my that. It don't belong to you. Hallelujah. It does not belong to us. Messiah wanted the apostles and his people to understand that they're to recognize Elohim as being the one that has all power and authority. Everything belongs to him. We are his stewards in the earth. And everything that he commands us to do, whether we see it as grandiose or whether we see it as something as simple and basic, when it comes from Abaya, it is to be regarded as sacred. It's not supposed to be something that we just say, oh, well, that doesn't really mean anything. It's not going to really do anything to make an impact. Really? It's kind of like almost how those religious leaders were when they saw that woman who came and cried on Messiah's feet and she opened up the alabaster box that had that expensive perfume and poured it on his feet. And the perfumes back then, they were mixed with oils, you know. And it says that she was wiping his feet, rubbing his feet with the oil. They didn't understand what that was all about, but what she was doing was something that Messiah considered as being sacred. He said, she's preparing my body for the... You, you, come on. Y'all don't understand what's going on. Anytime the Most High moves 
and touches his people to do a particular thing. We need to be careful how we tread upon it. And we need to be careful if we are involving ourselves in it that we make sure that we have the right heart and the right spirit and not try to get involved in it because we have some ulterior motive in mind. Ananias and Sapphira had some ulterior motive in mind for their own glorification. But I tell you something, the Holy Spirit is not going to allow any human being to get the glory that's supposed to be given to the Most High Yahuwah. And what we see happening here is that these two people, Ananias and Sapphira, this husband and wife, lost their lives at the expense of their own pride and desire to be seen among men. But we don't want to just stop there. As we move forward, we find that the people that observed this began to recognize the power that was upon these apostles. These were some things that were confirming the authority that the Almighty had given to the Shekhliachim, that's the Hebrew term for the apostles, that they, they, this authority had been confirmed upon them now because they, they began to recognize that, whoa, whoa, folk can't even come up and, and, and try and, and lie and get away with it because of the great power that's upon these apostles. Scripture teaches us, we look over in the 11th verse, check it out. It says, and great fear seized the whole assembly and all who heard these things. Verse 12, it says, now many signs and wonders were done among the people through the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's porch. Now, before I get to verse 13, I want to uh, say something about this because I said something in my previous teachings about how Solomon's porch was a gathering place or gathering spot in the temple grounds. So what we see here is that Solomon's porch became the location where the Messianic Israelite community were meeting regularly. They met up in the upper room, but we see here that Solomon's porch was also a regular meeting place. Why is that so? Because that was the place where they would meet daily for prayer time. So it appears that the apostles made that spot the hangout. They get up in the morning, they would go into the temple grounds to Solomon's porch for the first hour of the prayer time, and they probably hung out there, possibly throughout all of the other prayer times, because there were three prayer times. And so we see here that it says the whole assembly was gathered together. That's what it says. At least those who were in Jerusalem. That's where they were meeting. That's where they were conducting business. It appears that that's where this particular event took place as well. reason why I say that is because when you reread verse 13, it says, none of the rest, notice what it says, dared to join them. But the people held them in high esteem. Now those of the Messianic Israelite community weren't the only ones that were meeting at Solomon's porch. So we need to understand that. Solomon's porch was a place where Israelites all over Jerusalem would come during the time of prayer. Whether they were followers of the Messiah, Yahshua from Nazareth, or not. There were those who were of the Pharisees that would come there. There were those 
who were part of the sect of the Sadducees. There were those who would come there that also followed the Messiah, Yahshua. They would come to Solomon's porch because that was the general meeting place for the times of prayer. It says in that 13th verse that all of the people that were observing this, these were those who were not a part of the Messianic Israelite community. These are those who chose not to embrace Yahshua as being the Messiah. They were checking out what was going on and looking at all of this power that was being demonstrated. And it says that they held the apostles in high esteem. In another version, it says that they magnified them. I'll read it again. It says, none of the rest, the rest meaning those who were not followers of the Messiah, none of the rest dared to join them. I guess they figured, you know what, man, you know, it's, it's a whole lot of power and stuff going on. Folk dropping dead around there. We need to, you know, back it up. You know what I mean? They, people react in, in, in different ways. You know, when some people see the power of the Almighty, then they come and they submit themselves to the Almighty. They come to those who are being used in the signs and wonders and miracles. And they begin to ask questions about how can they become a part of this because they want to feel secured in the things of the Most High. So they want to attach themselves to that power. But then you have other folk, they, they're like, you know what? Uh, I'm just going to back up from that because, you know, it's some crazy stuff going on over there. You know, I don't know if they're doing some witchcraft or what they do. You know, you got other folks who, you know, they don't believe in what's going on, but they see manifestations. And they begin to take a negative position towards what's going on. So those individuals back themselves up, but the text says they had respect for them. It says, but the people held them in high esteem. So when we look at this whole section of scripture, what, what tends to be the theme is the authority that the Almighty had placed upon the apostles. What we see in this is how the, as the Most High made this shift from the governmental leadership of the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and gave that kingdom authority now to the apostles, that anyone who rose up to do anything against the move of the Spirit, be it to lie to the apostles or whatever it may be, they were going to deal with the consequences, the heavy consequences. In this case, it was death upon Ananias and Sapphira. But why was that power working like that to such a degree? As I said last week, these apostles were committed to the keeping of the Torah and to the doing of the will of the Most High Yah. These apostles were setting things in order, but they were doing it not for their own selves. The people recognized that the apostles were going to carry out Torah the way the Most High had desired for them to carry out Torah. So they sold their possessions and they gave it to the leadership to be the managers over the finances because that is the way the Almighty designed it in the scriptures. And what were the apostles doing? They were making sure that the needs of the whole Israelite community that followed the Messiah were taken care of. That's what they were doing. They were doing what the Almighty intended for them to do. They were being those governmental leaders that the most High wanted them to be. When you read the words of the prophets, when they were calling our ancient fathers to repentance before the Almighty sent other nations to take them into captivity, 
the prophets were saying that you are not concerned about the poor. That judgment is not being meted out properly. That those who have committed crimes are being declared innocent. And those who are innocent are being judged. He said that you step on the head of the poor and the needy and you smash it into the dirt. And the most I said for this, I'm going to send another nation to come and take you into captivity and scatter you throughout all of the nations. See, this was the base reason for our people going into captivity because they did not manage the affairs of the Almighty properly among the nation of Israel. And the same thing was going on in the first century with the Pharisees and the Sadducees where they were siphoning the, the, the resources from the Israelite community and not giving it back. And the Most High rose up the apostles, sent the Mashiach, rose up the apostles and gave them the authority to do what Torah says they were supposed to do. See, when you are obedient to the word of Torah, when you obey the commands of Elohim, and you don't have these big eyes and little U's and all of this Pompeii going on, you have the power because the Most High is being glorified because His people are walking in obedience to His commandments. That's why there was such great power among the apostles. It wasn't because that they were apostles. It wasn't because they were given a good word. They were doing what Elohim wanted. Would to Elohim that we in our generation today would rise up as a people and would do the commands of the Most High, would walk in love and be concerned about the needs of all saints and not try to fill our pockets and not be concerned and make excuses for what we have and what others who are in the Messianic Israelite community don't have. I know I just said a lot. But it's the truth anyhow. Great signs and wonders were done by the hands of the apostles. They were operating in the power of Elohim because they counted the things of the Most High sacred. And they had pledged themselves to be obedient to the word of Elohim. Many people want power. Why do you want power? For what? What do we want the power of Elohim for? Just so we can say, look, the power of Elohim is working among us. Why? So we can begin to gloat in the fact that we have the anointing? Is that what it is? You know, so oftentimes I watch television ministries and I hear radio ministries. And, and you know, when I was a younger uh, believer... Back in my teenage years, you know, I was very impressed by the preachers that would come up and they would come on the radio and they would talk about how the anointing's here and the power's here. You got to come on out. And everybody would go because they wanted the power. But very little was talked about about how the power comes, how the power remains. It comes through obedience, obedience, obedience. It don't matter how many times people lay hands on you, how many times folk fall out all over the place. It don't matter how many tongues are spoken in. It don't matter how many prophecies are given. If you prophesy, you speak in tongues, and then you don't obey the word of the Most High God, guess what the Messiah said? He said, many will come to me in that day and will say, Lord, we prophesy in your name. And in your name we cast out devils. And in your name we perform deeds of power. But he said, I will profess to you, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who violate Torah. You might say, 
I never read that last part in my translation of the Bible. It says, he that works iniquity. Well, when I preach and when I teach, I teach from the Greek translation. And the Greek translation says that the Messiah called them anomian, which means those who violate the Torah. You see, the keeping of the commandments of the Most High, while it is not the thing that will bring redemption for us, it is the thing that separates us and makes us a holy people. Scripture teaches us that we are sanctified through the truth. Yahshua said when he prayed to the Father for the disciples, he said, I pray, Father, for those that you've given me. You've given me them out of the world. He says that they are yours and what's yours are mine. But I'm asking you, Father, set them apart or sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. He said your word is truth. So what is the thing that sets us apart? What is the thing that makes us a holy people? What is the thing that makes us different? The Torah, the word of Elohim, the dead far Elohim. When I had uh, talked about a little earlier when we were reading in the scripture, and I had said that we're going to read from the book of, of Devarim, commonly called Deuteronomy. That word Devarim means the words. And when Messiah was praying, he said that the Devar, mm, your Devar is what sanctifies them. So you cannot be set apart. You cannot be sanctified until you recognize that that word, the Torah, the teaching is the thing that will set you apart. So what's going to bring the power in our life? See, the power of Elohim in our life is something that we experience in all places in our life. Not just in the sanctuary. Sometimes some folk come to the sanctuary because they want to see a show. Let's see who's going to get healed. Let's see who's going to get filled with the Spirit. Let's see who's going to get this. It seems like everything's supposed to happen at the sanctuary. The power of the Most High Yah happens everywhere and in every place. And at any time in our life, He shows up. He moves. Why? Because we keep His commandments. And do those things that are pleasing his sight. I'm going to close on that note. Let us pray. Abba Yah, thank you for your grace, your kindness, and your mercy toward us. I trust that the word that has gone forth has brought conviction and has challenged the hearts of the hearer. I pray most high that it has caused us to begin to think about the things that are of great importance to you. May we regard your ways, your service, as something that is sacred. And may those who don't know you in the pardon of their sins May they turn in repentance and come to you with open hearts and submitted lives that they might know the true and living Elohim through our Messiah, Yahshua. We thank you, Most High. In the mighty name of Yahshua, we give thanks. Amen. I trust that the teaching has been informative and helpful that it builds you up in your faith may it cause you to regard the creator in sacredness and in holiness because there are some things that he will not tolerate from us when we come with an attitude of pride and don't regard him as being the most holy.
or his ways or his men or his women that represent him in the earth. That we learn to respect those things that pertain to the Most High. May his great name be praised. At this time, we want to prepare ourselves for sharing in communion together. And so I'm going to speak blessing over the bread and the cup. Ta Yahuwah Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Hamotzi Lechem Min HaAretz Blessed are you, O Yahuwah our Elohim, King of the universe, bringer of bread from the earth. We thank you for our Messiah Yahshua that you have given as our bread of life and our manna from heaven. Regarding the cup, for those of you who have your cup, Barukata Yahuwah, Eloheinu Melech Ha Olam. Bore pri hagafen. Blessed are you, O Yahuwah, our Elohim, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. We bless you for the spilled blood of our Messiah, Yahshua, that has been given for our redemption and healing in the renewed covenant. Baruch Hashem. Hallelujah. to the bread for all of you that have your bread that has been blessed we bless the almighty for Messiah being our bread of life and our manna from heaven you made the bread regarding the cup we bless the most high for Yahshua his blood being spilled for our redemption and healing in the renewed covenant. You may drink the cup. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Most High be praised. The Most High be praised. May the Almighty bless you and strengthen you as you have shared together in this communion that you receive spiritual healing, physical healing, let manifestations come upon your life, let it come upon your finances, let it come in your home, let shalom be in your dwelling. And that the full measure of his blessing be upon you, that he may establish his covenant in your life as you live obediently, obediently before him. Hallelujah. The Most High be praised. At this time, we want to speak the final blessing, and then we will be dismissed. Ileka vikuneka yesa yahuwa panav. Ileka veyesim leka shalom. 
Now may Yahuwah bless you and protect you. May Yahuwah make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahuwah lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom. Avinu shalom aleichem. Our Father's peace be upon you. Shabbat shalom. Go in his peace and rejoice in his favor. You're dismissed.